hospitality was overwhelming, and I have forgotten how strong is Trappista beer. Uh, 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 yeah, when someone gets uh, such a high accolade in science, like a Nobel Prize, usually people ask only two questions, okay, how and why sometimes, how, how can I get it? The same, okay, <laughs> tell us your secret and why it's either what's so special or why this particular guy got, uh, got this, why, why can't I get the same, yeah, of course. <laughs> Of course, of course you can. So my plan for my lecture is to tell the story behind and uh, then tell you what's so special about this material, graphene, why it did deserve the Nobel Prize. So that's the plan for the talk. Uh, as Jean uh, told you, okay, sort of at the age of... Uh, 36 and with uh, HI index around one or two, which were mainly self citations. I got, uh, I got uh, a position in the Netherlands at the University of Nijmegen, and it was a permanent position. So uh, then, all the rush usually people have to establish the same themselves in the line has gone, and then you can enjoy yourself and either, either do what you have been doing for the last 20 years of your life or try to find something, something new and interesting. And I always told and tell to my PhD students and postdocs that scientists are not uh, paid well enough to suffer from the border doing the same research for, for 40 years. So. I started doing, for one or another reason, uh, start doing some random experiments, which I never thought would initially bring something, something interesting. But OK, I'll give you a few examples of those experiments. How did it come? Why I started doing these experiments? And it's not a very usual style in modern day academia, but I tried. and. Uh, probably two, three dozens of those experiments. Some of those works, so of course, only successful couple of examples will be here. So that was at early days of my, my uh, time at Nijmegen. Someone called those experiments Friday night experiments. We tried to figure out who this was. People claim that I call them Friday night experiments because we had a lot of beer on Friday nights. But in fact, in fact, uh, those experiments can be done at any day or week, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as you know, as, uh, uh, as today. So, uh, can, can I? Can we, yeah. So uh, it's, I worked for high field magnet facilities, which is a European facility. And uh, people who deal with facilities, they know quite well that uh, initially you come with some projects and tell the European Commission and the government, so if you don't give us money, uh, world science would never survive. Okay, then you get this money for the, these big facilities, and it turned out that, OK, you don't know who will be using these facilities. So those big magnets, they consume electricity to run something enough to probably uh, power at night uh, the whole household. And uh, they consume a lot of cooling water. And at the end, within the bore, which is like that, you get a magnetic field of the order of 20 Tesla. So, well, because it's expensive to run, not to make, but to run those magnets, we had to do our experiments indeed at night. And, uh, and we couldn't find people who would like to use those magnets. I also didn't like to use them. And, but I had a lot of pressure as a new member of this department how to use those aging magnets. Uh, and, uh, Eventually, I came up with the idea. So the idea is 
trivial and you probably heard about magnetic water. So if you look on the internet and probably uh, go into, I don't know, uh, uh, some uh, DIY store, do it yourself store, you'll find out that there are plenty, a variety of magnets which you allegedly you put on your uh, uh, water tap and then after few months, all scale on your catalogs uh, or in the tube should disappear. Actually, scientifically, I don't have anything to contribute to this problem. I don't know whether it works and how it works and so on. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, so it's complicated. But that was the original idea. So if these magnets work, so why our Asian magnets won't work? Uh, what would happen if we put the same water, but not with this magnet, but with this huge magnet? Somehow no one before did ask this experiment, so after discussing this experiment probably for a couple of weeks or even longer, I said, all right, let's do experiment. Brought a bottle of water at one night and literally pour it inside the magnet. You know, it's not a real scientific style to pour water on top of your very expensive equipment. And people, people ask why I did it, and I, I never, I just, uh, I, I don't know why I did it. But, uh, but at the end, okay, uh, we saw this. So uh, you look at uh, through the bore of this magnet. It's done with my Brazilian student together, Humberto Carmona. And uh, somewhere at this place in the magnet, you see a ball of water. In this case, it's, it's pretty big, three, five centimeters in diameter, freely floats in air. It takes a little bit of adjustment magnetic field, but you see, quite nice, okay. Initial phenomena, it's called diamagnetism, so all substances, everything has atoms, and when atoms put in magnetic field, they see some repulsion. And uh, uh, those materials, called magnetic materials like iron, nickel, and so on, they're really an exception. All other materials are essentially diamagnetic. And uh, taking typical numbers, typical density, you'll find out that magnetic field inside the magnet is just enough to compensate the gravity the gravity. So I look at those nice videos and pictures and thought, okay, that probably the only importance of them would be a therapeutical. You watched it, you see that you're getting more and more relaxed the longer you watch <laughs> you, uh, you watch the, those vi videos. Okay, and uh, the, go the good thing about physics, okay, is that, uh, that then you can grow whatever you want, strawberries and tomatoes in the magnet. My Dutch colleagues had many other brilliant ideas what, <laughs> what you can put inside. So essentially every, everything floats from beer to wine and so different strawberries and so on. So I had for a couple of months a queue of people who wanted who wanted to watch. They didn't believe the rumors that everything levitates. And, and most of those were people working with magnetic fields for 40, 50 years during their professional lives. They never thought about this simple pouring experiments to put something in, in a magnetic field. So I eventually I, I got tight about, the, the, about showing, showing. And I start looking, OK, how to to make something useful, not only relaxing, but useful out of this. And, uh, and uh, I get another fun and uh, publish a couple of papers. One was with Michael Kawasa, also Sir Michael Berry. Uh, uh, Michael Berry, famous uh, scientist already in early 90s, famous for his Berry face. And, uh, but, uh, I didn't get much help in my experiments. My Brazilian students was also for a week, so uh, so I I did another experiment with with uh, with 
HM Tertisha, and it sounds very Dutch, but then you can see what, what it comes into play. It's comes the Tisha, and uh, my colleagues uh, uh, had this uh, misfortune sometimes asking, why did I put this, uh, this uh, uh, Tisha? Uh, his n nickname was, why do you put he, him in t into the magnet? Well, for two reasons. First of all, he, he was the smallest animal I could find in a pet shop who would, <laughs> who would fit into the magnet. And the second, and so sometimes very unexpected declaration for my colleagues, I, I told them that this was the only person in the whole lab who helped me in those experiments. Uh, uh, so, but OK. Unfortunately, despite being very small, that's, I, th I think it's about five centimeters, even less, especially when a baby hamster, uh, after being put in the magnet, it's smart. It's, it doesn't like it, apparently. like it, does, it doesn't like this levitation more than astronauts like this uh, uh, being in, in space. So immediately it's got, it goes uh, like a chim in a chimney, as a mountain climber in a chimney and tries to climb out of there. So no nice pictures like with tomatoes and potatoes. So we have to find another another one, and at that moment it has to become clear that no one did realize that this feeble diamagnetism is really, really something which, which brings such a dramatic phenomena as, uh, as uh, levitation. So th this kind of facilities existed for 60 years already, but somehow considered to be, to be yeah, very feeble phenomena. So eventually, we found a hero, and the hero was even smaller a baby frog. This is actually one, two centimeters in size. And I'm proud of this experiment. I consider this is experiment really of tough experimentalists, because as condensed matter physicists, I usually deal with very small scenes under microscope and so on, and it's tricky. But those scenes which my samples of today, they, they do not jump and they do not stick to your fingers. So to put this, this little creature inside the magnet somewhere 20, 20 centimeters inside at a precise spot where it would levitate, it took all my experimental expertise. So that's, 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 that, was, that was really tough, frankly speaking, and eventually we managed to have only a few seconds of, of video because TV crews insisted to go that. But at the end, I think it's, uh, it's proved to be useful. It, it took probably a few, few months of my life to especially to prove the colleagues that it was not a joke. The best compliment I have ever had about this experiment, I went to a conference and showed this picture. It was Dutch Feldhoven's. Uh, condensed matter meeting, and some series, well-established series, said, oh, it's all a hoax. I make calculations. You missed them. You cheated us. There is a factor of pi missing in your calculations. Pi is 3.5. So this is how series usually think in terms of real experiments. So OK, and uh, that's the end of my first story. And to vindicate that it was not a joke that there was something scientific inside. Let me rest my case with this letter I got in 1997, I believe. OK, I'm very interested in know how the frogs got to flow. I'm nine years old, and I won't become a scientist. That's very sweet. I still keep this on my, above my, my desk in Manchester University. Yeah. And this is the real person. The, two years later, she was invited to give a, an interview to a local radio of Alaska. And uh, she called me for an advice. Okay, yeah. um, so you know, 
once you learn how to ride a bike, especially with that sort of publicity which was around, uh, you always try to repeat the, this kind of experiences, maybe not publicity, which I don't like that much, but, uh, but there was something interesting in doing this sort of out of normal research experiments. And once I came across of uh, research by American group, which explained how geckos climb ceilings and walls. And this is actually in slow motion, actually very, very uh, clear and nice motion. So what happens, uh, the toes of geckos are covered with uh, lamella, and at the end of those lamella there are plenty of tiny, tiny hairs, like hairs on your beard if you're a man, but uh, much, much, uh, much, uh, uh, smaller in diameter. So when you touch with this hair a surface of another material, there is a force, an attractive force, which is called Van der Waals force, and it's completely general phenomena. Whatever you put in touch, there is a small force. It's called Van der Waals, again considered extremely weak and can be probed only in scientific environment. But actually, geckos utilize this force because they have not one hair, but billions of those very densely. Each force is nanonewton, one billionth of newton from each hair. But when you get many, many billions of hairs working together, it creates a quite a formidable force to keep the animals on, on top of the ceiling. This is what what people did discover and, uh, and uh, explain this ability. But what struck me, the size of those cares is submicron. This is exactly the size which I was dealing, doing my other research, which I was paid for, some mesoscopic superconductivity, semiconductor physics, which, which I'm not discussing this. It would be too, uh, too obscure for, for people outside the specific research area. So if we get facilities to produce those hairs, why wouldn't we, wouldn't we repeat the same what nature does? And we did. It's, uh, yeah, especially 10 years ago, it requires a lot of effort to make a one centimeter square piece of material which looks like that, mimicked hair. We didn't manage to make exact mimicry of toes, so after a few attachments, those hairs cluttered together and no longer stick, but it was enough for one, two stickiness, and uh, unfortunately we could produce only one square centimeter. I dreamed and tried to produce a glove, a gecko glove using this material, uh, material to let one of the students uh, 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 out of the window to hand and make, <laughs> make a photograph, but then we decided that, uh, that we should save the material, okay? Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so one centimeter uh, was enough only to put a toy model hanging on this one. So it's in, <coughs> in a sense, it worked, worked pretty badly, but it started sort of a research area in the field of adhesives, which is called dry adhesives. And uh, yeah, now quite, quite, quite uh, vibrant research area. People, I have seen humans hanging from, from the ceiling uh, on, on TV using the same principle, but no gloves yet because cluttering is the problem. But OK, it's, uh, it's a nice experiment how how something random, unexpected, can bring you something which, which brings into this sort of new material. So uh, there were quite a few other experiments. Some are less successful than others, but okay, in a sense, okay, uh, the next big story was graphene. And it's also started, started with a, a similar, uh, simple, uh, simple idea what you can do 
with, uh, without any facilities with, with, in this case, with scotch tape. So the story goes like that, okay? I get Jean Da, my Chinese student, who badly spoke uh, English after, after four years of, of his studies in Manchester, and you can imagine how did he speak English in, uh, at the beginning. Uh, so I gave him, I saw graphite is very interesting material. Never before <coughs> I, I, I even published anything concerning carbon or graphite and so on, but I thought, okay, we get facilities, we get interest, we get background. Why wouldn't we make very thin film of graphite? and see how it behaves. So very sort of scientific project. And, and uh, yeah, what do, do you do? Piece of graphite cost me 300 bucks. Uh, and I gave it to him and say, try to make a thin film. If you make a thin film by polishing, it's impossible, at least at that time I thought it was impossible to make a thin film of graphite by other techniques. Try to polish it down to something like micron thickness and so on. So a couple of months later, he comes to me with a petri dish with a tiny flake on the center and say, I did it. Look at it, OK? I look in a microscope and, uh, and see this little flake estimated by focusing, estimated the thickness of this flake. It was not one micron. It was probably 10 microns and that center. I say, well, maybe you can do this and that and that, because he, 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 this project was not something I, I really cared. This project was to for him to learn how to use facilities, uh, learn some English, the way to go around lab, and so on. So it was it was introductory project to to learn the style of the lab. And he he said, okay, I did it. I said, okay, try more, a couple of months more. If you succeed, it will measure it. If you don't succeed, I'll give you another project. He looks at me and say, can I get another piece of graphite? <laughs> So what he did, he just polished it away down to, the, to this one. Okay, so at that moment, you can imagine my reaction, which is, uh, which is not always modest any, in any case. So I was mocking about that you don't need to polish the whole mountain to make a, a, a piece of a grain. And there was another postdoctoral fellow at the time, uh, a guy from, from Ukraine, uh, an old guy, who said, ah, wait a bit, why do you polish this one? Look what we have. And indeed, okay, what we routinely use, and in this university, probably there are at least 10 people who know what is atomic force microscopy is, what is scanning tunnel in microscopy is, and there you use routinely these pieces of graphite. And then to make the surface clean, you take a scotch tape, you put on top of this graphite, peel it away, put graphite into your equipment, and throw this piece into a little bit. So that's why do you polish it? Let's take uh, scotch tape and see what happens. So we dig out this uh, piece of scotch tape from a little bin nearly literally look in a microscope and then looking in the microscope I nearly realized that it might be the Nobel Prize over there. So essentially what you see here, you see light going through these pieces of graphite. Those dark dark pieces, it's thick graphite, you don't Light doesn't go through, but this one is transparent graphite. At that time, I didn't know how to, to estimate the thickness of, of this piece. Now I know that it's probably 5 to 10 layers, something like that. Very thin. It's uh, 3 nanometers, something like that. It's impossible something to polish down to this thickness. It's very hard to get any films uh, of this thickness. It's really, 
really unique. Uh, anyone who is dealing with surface science, they know how the thinner the film, the less stable this film in it reacts with the air, it uh, decomposes. You really need to go to thicknesses something like 1,000 less, and then it becomes stable. So yeah, obvious conclusion from this part of the project was that we should stop polishing, OK, use scotch tape. Uh, I was excited about this because of my background knowledge about surface science and uh, about uh, how difficult to make thin films. But in general, OK, one can be very suspicious, all right, you get this, OK, whatever, stuck to the surface. Why should be we interested in, what, in these leftovers on scotch tape? Um, what you need to take into account if you, scientifically speaking, if you try to look around yourselves, try to look in your labs or on your desk on materials which we as human beings are dealing with, everything has three dimensions, width, length, height, and so on. So we are not familiar with materials, only with abstract concepts, but with materials which have one of those parameters missing. And we do not have materials which are one atom, at least until recently, one atom or one molecule thick. Why it is so, why they do not occur in nature, one can think we just don't see them. It's not actually true. This is sort of molecular simulation movie. We put 1,000 atoms inside the box and heat them up. It's carbon atoms and heat it up to the extent that they can merge together. What you see originally, how the nature works, that originally you can see worms, and then flat pieces. But the longer you wait, the, lo the more material you put, everything goes into three dimensions. You can say, yeah, the nature d disallows uh, low dimensional materials because those vibrations break down any, di any order in low dimensions. Or you can say the nature is so smart that the nature thinks, why do we need to, to use only two or one dimensions? Let's use all three dimensions. That's how everything, everything goes in nature. So of course, uh, if it's forbidden in nature, it doesn't mean that it cannot exist. That's what the definition of artificial means. So you can think about simple Gedanken experiment. Well, take a piece of any three-dimensional material, cooking salt, for instance. You can think about this as a collection of three-dimensional collection of atoms, and we know that they certainly exist. No problems with that. So uh, then, because it exists in our conditions, you can think about taking uh, very small tweezers, and with the help of very small students, you pull out an atomic plane out of those. That's allowed by laws of physics, because no longer high temperature needed for growth materials is present. We live at a relatively low temperature, which is our room temperature conditions. And the materials like graphite, they have to be grown at temperatures 3,000 centigrade. So room temperature is not really a problem for them. That's essentially what we have done in our experiment. We take a material grown at very high temperature, cool it down to our room temperature, and then extract it one atomic plane. It seems to be very simple, but apparently no one has done this before. And initially, we saw it was a really very scientific, you, you, using some high-tech facilities like atomic force microscope. And it took really a trouble to prove people that it's a one atomic layer. People didn't believe. Uh, yeah, people say that it's impossible. The referees rejected our paper actually twice from nature. Uh, one of the referees wrote that, uh, that, okay, this paper 
uh, is wrong because materials can't exist as single layers, that it's an artifact. Another referee wrote it's a sign that uh, there is no any scientific advance. So, but eventually we published it, and then the hype started. So if you recently have your paper or some thesis rejected, yeah, don't worry, this tells you that it might be also a Nobel Prize winner. So <laughs> that was that was very hard originally. Two years later, when you know what to look at, we have already seen pieces which are one millimeter in size. You can see them by naked eye. What you see here, this is a one atom thick, nano nano, okay, 10 minus 10 meter, one billionth of uh, 100 millions of, uh, of centimeter, very, very thin piece, one atom thick. You see it by naked eye, and it's a monocrystal. There are no defects, there is nothing in this plane. And it's, it's reasonable in one centimeter. These days, nearly 10 years later, less than 10 years later, it's actually six years later, people produce like you will see a picture. It's already meters by meters uh, square, this material. And uh, yeah, this how it shows that yeah, once you know what to look at, you can, you can really gear up and, and find a way to produce those materials. So this is, would be good, probably would be nice to show that you can use this way to extract in the planes, but that would certainly would be not enough uh, to get any prize, leaving aside Nobel Prize. Because initially, looking at this material, this is how it looks imagine, in imagination. There are carbon atoms, and they are like in benzene rims, and this is an infinite chicken wire as uh, in English, uh, in English, uh, uh, is said, um, you don't really expect anything unique from this structure. But then we start looking at the properties of this material, and that's where real surprises came from. Of course, the, and so over, over sort of five years, I stopped doing this now. But over five years, I collected a list of super superlatives of this material, looking at the properties of this material. Of course, <laughs> nothing, no material can be probably thinner than one atom, unless you go into science fiction. And uh, it's so thin that one uh, gram of this material is enough to cover the whole football pitch. You know, in Manchester, we measure everything in football pitches. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, those properties come from, uh, from, from the fact that it's so thin. But then you start to measure. And this turns out that this is the strongest material, not our research, but other people, people ever measured. Of course, you have to take into account that it's very thin. but uh, But... I, before people calculated, I, I saw this material exist only, only on the substrate and then on the membranes. But then people make calculations. You can use this one meter square, square material and place some one kilo on that, and it would be enough, despite it's only one atom thick. It's stronger than diamond by a factor of three, and it doesn't have defects to give those cracks. It's extremely strong. It's the stiffest material we know. It's stiffer than diamond, uh, sort of three times stiffer. But try to stretch diamond. You crack it. Uh, Graphene is stretchable by 20%, and it's completely pliable. You can, you can sort of bend it 90 degrees. Crystals would crack, but this crystal goes this way and another way without, without, without cracking. It's pliable material as well. It conducts heat better than anything we know, diamonds or graphite. It sustains huge current densities, actually. It's thousands, millions, actually, times better than copper. Essentially, one chain of carbon atoms would be enough to sustain electricity to, uh, to cover 
um, chips in your mobile, uh, it provides electricity for transistors in your mobile circuit. So it's amazing in this respect. It's completely impermeable material. Even helium, the lightest and most squeezable material doesn't go through. I'll come back to this point. And then we, we start measuring some properties of electrical properties and so on, OK? So many others, OK? I'll touch on those properties. And the list still, still grows and grows. So all this brought to some kind of uh, new paradigm in science. And most of this comes how this material behaves in terms of electricity, how you can pay it with respect to gold, copper, silicon, and so on. It turns out to be a very unique material. I'll give you a crash course in solid state physics on one transparency. So one can consider electrons which travel through any material like bullets. It turned out to be not really a very good description. Usually, electrons travel in material like waves, more like waves. And this is described by so-called Schrodinger equation. And because there are ions, they interact with the ions. But then, OK, you can renormalize this interaction and put this star here, which tells you tells everything about interaction. That's actually quite simple and maybe pathetic even, but this is what solid state physicists like myself are dealing with, trying to understand this equation plus many, many other terms in that. That's physics of metals and semiconductor physics. If you think that other kind of physics community, particle physicists or astrophysicists are doing something more fundamental. Well, I have to disappoint you. They are dealing with equally pathetic equation, which is called uh, Dirac equation. Okay, so when you put your particles to very high speeds, close to the speed of light, then instead of this equation, you get another equation, and if the this arrow tells you about spin, a property, magnetic property of electrons. And it's independent in this equation, but in this equation that direction of your motion of electrons and direction of its magnetic moment, they're 100% uh, coupled. So electrons go this way, spin looks this way, this way, it also has to look in the opposite direction. So that's my crash course. So where graphene comes into play, in graphene, it turned out that this mass goes to zero. Essentially, it goes from normal speed to a particle which are moving very fast, not with the speed of light, but with a very high speed, 300 times uh, slower than the speed of light. But they have to be described, the interaction of electrons with the carbon lattice have to be described by this equation, which mimics, it's not the same equation, but it mimics what particle physicists and astrophysicists can observe. So immediately, due to this strange play of uh, of physics and because it's a chicken wire hexagonal lattice of one carbon atoms, you'll get something which is like a uh, uh, serum, but on your desktop. So you can address in a reasonably simple experiment phenomena which can be addressed only in those high field, high energy facilities and so on. But moreover, it can do something which high energy facilities cannot do at all. And I'll give you a couple of examples of those. So that's one of those popular examples. The phenomenon of Klein tunneling is, has been known for, for 70, 80 years, tried many times, considered not to be observable because too hard to make this experiment for the next hundred or maybe even thousand years. So what this is this experiment about? If you have a car, you know what would happen with your car if you go in the wall. That's our normal uh, world. If we're talking about small particles or 
uh, electrons. That's we are talking about not classical world, but quantum world. In quantum world, if you imagine very, very small car angstroms uh, of size, and you get a barrier, the car partly goes through, it goes, goes through, the rest left here. So probability going through and probability being found burned can be calculated depending how wide and how high the barrier. Now let's imagine that you live in graphene world inside this graphene sheet. And your car is made from those particles which are moved, electrons which are moved within graphene sheet. In this case, you try to construct the barrier very high and very wide. And what you find out that your car goes through this barrier without any, any impedance at all. Perfect tu tunneling or Klein tunneling. This refers to those specific electron waves which, which travel through graphene sheet. It can't travel from one graphene sheet to another sheet because it would leave one graphene universe and go to another graphene universe. So, but within a single piece of graphene, it's very valid. Another example, and this is not theory. It's what we routinely observe and how to explain most of the phenomena of electro, why it's so conductive and so on. This is, a, this is one of the most fundamental phenomena which you need to know to describe properties of this material, electronic properties of material. That's also a very fundamental example, my example two. Uh, it's about the periodic table. You know periodic table, you know this Born model of atoms, nuclei, electrons moving around, and how many uh, you have in this table, 116, okay, 110 elements we know. Different charges of nuclei, different number of electrons around, and a valid question, take a uh, science fiction book and people say, oh, we found some a spaceship came around, okay, with a very heavy, heavy materials used in this. So the valid question is, can you extend this periodic table further. Imagine people talking about, okay, some very heavy nuclei which could be stable. You can imagine that they could be stable. Whether you can construct, extend this periodic table. The fundamental answer is known for 60, 50 years is that not in our universe, we are limited in the number of elements we can construct. And the reason is very simple. Until you exceed some critical charge of your nuclei, you get this Bohr magneton model. But when you go above this number, actually above number 170, you find out that this quantum mechanics is no longer capable or support of this radial motion. and the electrons would fall onto the center of the Coulomb center and so on to emit electrons. That's a cartoon, but essentially you can't construct because this is fine structure constant, which is mysterious. Why it's 1 over 137? No one knows. It's a philosophical debate whether it can be different from this one, but the fact is that you can't construct heavy atoms. Graphene comes, this phenomenon known in theory, people did try in the 60s to create temporarily very high atoms and see this fall on the nuclei, didn't succeed. But remember I told you that electrons mimic in graphene the relativistic quantum physics. So this number is 300 times smaller. So interaction between electrons and charges in graphene is very strong. It's about a one. So in this case, even if you put one, in, actually people did this experiment only this year, managed to succeed in doing this experiment in graphene. They put five uh, or four potassium atoms together, and they, they 
have seen this phenomena, so negative charge goes in, positive charge is injected. It's, it's seen like some weird screening in this one. But this phenomena at last has been probed thanks, thanks to graphene, so we can confirm that those theories were all right. That's another example of extremely simple phenomena which you can do at home at the same time it's a very fundamental because it involves a real fine structure constant. It was done uh, sort of three, four years ago. At that time, we could make a very small pieces. And uh, my group was the first to make membranes out of graphene. This is approximately, sub this is one millimeter inside. And this is 100 microns. So we put graphene partially covering this membrane, make a small aperture, and uh, look how the light goes through graphene. That's air, light goes through, that's one layer of graphene, this is two layers of graphene, and you see the contrast. This is essentially what you see by your naked eye. These days when you get these big sheets of graphene, you can do this experiment without much problem. And then where Real science comes into play. You not only do observation, you do conclusions, you do analysis. And we find out that the amount of light absorbed is at the edge of our glass sensitivity. It's graphene is gray. It's absorbed all over the frequencies. It's its color. And uh, the amount of light is 2.3%. 2.3% for a layman, if you didn't study physics, it it's, uh, might sound like a random number. In fact, when you put numbers together, you find out that what is absorbed, with the help of theory, of course, it's pi times fine structure constant. This is 137 by 3.4. It's exactly this number. So in a sense, what we do in this experiment, we probe coupling of relativistic-like charges with light, which is described by the coupling constant. And this fine structure constant, it's also sometimes described by, as a coupling constant. So essentially, if you have a piece of graphene and uh, some, by some strange circumstances find yourself in another universe, you look at the sun over there, and you see that it's 2.3, that you can be sure you're still in our universe. That's, I, I gave you those, those examples, okay, how, how it's a very thin slice what can be done with graphene, how unusual, how, how interesting material is. But the area is really, has, has, no, has no time to, for retirement, I would say. I would like, okay, at least a little bit to stop working as hard as we have been working over the last 10 years. But that's an example came last year only. So that was, you can consider this as a Friday night experiment. I can, so uh, I'll, you will see why it is so. So we knew from previous literature that a single piece of graphene is completely impermeable even for helium. So, but it's hard to make a simple piece of graphene, so uh, it's much easier to make a laminate. It's pieces stacked together. It's not continuous, but, but a small flake here, 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 here. And uh, we tried it, how impermeable it is, hoping that you can make sort of so, some kind completely impermeable things with a very thin films. It's less than my 100 nanometers in thickness, the, this one. And we covered a helium bottle with this one. And as expected, 100 nanometers is the thinnest we could make. It would be thinner, it would be the same, completely impermeable gas. This most uh, uh, gas, uh, most permeable gas stays here, seals it completely. And we estimated how good it is. It's equivalent of one centimeter of glass. So impermeable, this million times thinner piece of graphene. That was all right until we put this uh, 
water inside. And when we put water inside and start heating this water, we saw vapor coming out, steam coming out of the bottom. I saw membrane broken and etc. It took us quite some time to understand this experiment and even to believe that it's completely impermeable to gas, but water vapor goes without any, any resistance. You break the membrane, the same amount of steam coming out and etc. So it's an oxymoron, most impermeable to most permeable gas and super permeable for water. So yeah, we eventually think that we understand how it works, but I think that there should be some magic left in this world. So I'll leave you with this one, saying that we try this. On one Friday night, we put a bottle of a whiskey inside <laughs> and left it for a week and we'll get at the end well distilled whiskey in a few months. Only water gets away and all good stuff. I mean, ethanol <laughs> was left around. So uh, I, gave, I gave you an example how unusual and how really, really wonderful this material is. And uh, the only thing I like to say that it's, uh, yeah, it seems to be, it continues to deliver this uh, this wonders uh, every year. So my talk, one, my last okay, ten minutes or so, is about okay people, especially if you are speaking about politicians, not scientists. They were saying, "Oh, what is a wonderful material? Can we use it somehow?" Okay. So essentially, uh, initially, I usually answer to those. Uh, answers like saying, OK, look how many superlatives it has. Of course, OK, you can think about using them for something uh, new and competitive. So, But after I got bought with those politically correct answers, I always tell the same story. So I think I have a time to tell the story, the story to you. So uh, once I was on a boat trip, uh, watching dolphins, okay, I, I managed to swim with dolphins a couple of times, but uh, that was in open ocean, wild, not trained animals, and usually they do not like people, okay, who loves them, uh, and uh, uh, they come to the boat and wanted to play. I have never seen or heard this before, so Everyone on the board, 10 or so clients, tourist clients, leaning over the board, well, probably 20, trying to touch them, and dolphins trying to touch us. Imagine, yeah, magic moments, okay? Everyone was at awe, and it was silence for two, three minutes. We enjoyed this romantic moment. And then suddenly, a little boy behind shouts, Ma'am! Can we eat them? <laughs> so uh, the same happens with uh, politicians and etc. So we are still enjoying this romantic moment with with graphene and uh, and uh, and uh, people shout, "Can we eat it?" Okay. So in a sense, in a sense, yeah, it's a sad story, but uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, reflex. But the answer is probably yes. It's very early days of uh, graphene research, but it usually <laughs> takes, uh, dependent on the area, from 20 to 40 years to go from academic research from uh, newly found material to some potential, uh, not potential, consumer products. It's only less than 10 years has been found. And there are many people who suggest, OK, hundreds and thousands of applications. Some of them seem or seemed to be completely unrealistic. Graphene instead of silicon, it's very fine front. I can't say that it's unrealistic or realistic. It's just, OK, so far behind the horizon, maybe 20 years, maybe we have different perspective. We can't predict the future. So, Or DNA pulls through a small hole, and all those CTA sequences electrically 
pop up on your screen, people working on, on this as well. So, but then there are more realistic applications closer to what you say, to realization, like putting graphene into plastics, or probably the most realistic is touch screens where you use uh, the fact that graphene is very conductive, very thin, and very transparent. So I just want to say that I don't know, but in order to be more specific, this is probably the closest to the market. And let me describe only one example of this. Uh, if you have a computer screen or mobile screen or this projector which projects on the screen, they use so-called ITO, indium tin oxide. It's transparent metal. It's highly conductive and at the same time it allows uh, light in the, in the visible region to go through. It's getting expensive because of indium and it's it's not cheap anyway. Anyway, so uh, at early days of our research, we look at, so OK, it's very transparent, more transparent than typical graphene oxide. And it's pretty conductive, not quite as indium tin oxide, but pretty good one. Why wouldn't we use graphene in all those applications where, where it's ITO? indium tin oxide now. But so essentially graphene is an electrode, a very simple material as a conductive transparent metal in all those applications, with a small difference that it's bendable and stretchable and so on. So uh, what it was 2008, four years ago, five years ago, it was, uh, it was uh, sort of we get very small pieces of graphene at that time, um, but could demonstrate one pixel. You need, you know, million pixels for your computer screen. But it was a simple, uh, simple uh, presentation that it can be possible. Of course, two years later, we didn't expect that people make one meter. It's 30 inch nowadays. I think people offer. 10 by 10 meters to produce if someone interested to spend $100,000 on this big sheet. But uh, uh, resistivity goes down better and better and better these days, and it's getting cheap and cheaper every day. So many it have advantages, especially it's chemically alert and it can be stretchable. It brought attention of many companies and many research groups outside and uh, how, uh, how, how realistic this interest. Okay, this is video from two, three years ago coming from Samsung, but similar advertised by Nokia. It's uh, future electronics, whether it will be this or that, I don't know. But graphene plays a role. And you see, uh, yeah, we're probably in a very fine future with this one. But the only thing I know at the moment is that this graphene already in some test devices for mobile phone com uh, computer screens, and not because it's better, actually, because it's cheaper in some mo mobile phones. We'll see what the future brings to us, but it looks, I'm not responsible. Nobel Prize doesn't put any responsibility on me in terms of <laughs> applications, okay? It was in physics, not in applications uh, price, but I'm hopeful that it brings some consumer products. And my final transparency, not that final, it's just, uh, just my final transparency after saying that uh, applications are probably coming, but the extent remains unclear, is to summarize this by the, by the picture of the pencil. If you take pencil, piece of paper, or something, draw a line. It's a pencil trace. It's dark because Pencil contains graphite, and graphite slides 
by this scotch, as you saw from scotch tape very easily, those remnants of graphite are left on the surface. If you take a microscope or even a magnifying glass, you look at through this pencil trace and see pieces of graphite left on the surface. But if you see carefully enough, you'll find some of those pieces are very thin. Some of them are even one atom thick, which is, which is graphene. Essentially, this material was in front of our eyes, under literally under our noses for 500 years. But it took to 21st century to find out how how wonderful this material is. So when people say physics, science is dead, we investigated everything, I'll give this story as an example how little we know about the world around us. Thank you very much for your attention.